So I'm seeing this here for a little start. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for your interest in this topic. I hope you can hear me. Uh, um, my name is Thierry Berg. I'm working at the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence in Saarbrücken, Germany. And this is John. You can say where you're working. Is it too large? Yeah, it's on the international university by the way. So I need to be following the rest of the Okay. So it's really international. Mm -hmm. So yes, our, our goal is as a project, the course that we learn to work uh, with uh, RTS coming. And for the semantic web language, they ask who has been in touch with RTF before. Some few of you. Perfect. Uh, and the rest within the appointment. So it will be a bit introductory in the first course, but then later those who are already working with RTF can help the other people to, uh, to improve their knowledge. Um, <coughs> But I said, our goal is to learn to, to work with RTF and, and other related vocabularies to be able to define your own uh, lexical or linguistic resource using semantic web technologies. So today we will have a, a broad introduction going to uh, all those languages, and tomorrow we will have a first practical session. And for this, uh, you will need to download a, a software called Protege. And we will do this at the end of the session today. Or you can do this this afternoon. <laughs> it's pretty easy. So maybe you will not be able to teach. <laughs> Let's hope you will be healthy tomorrow. Okay? Um, so download this, this tool called Protege. So those who are working with ADF probably know this tool. And then we will start uh, implementing. Um, as I said, lexical or linguistic resource on our own, and we will give you all the details that you need in order to be able to implement those kind of. Uh... So, there was a question about the future science, where well, actually, yes, as John said, this is in the between of uh, linguistics and computer science, so we will work on this. Um, so, there is first one question do you need a break after? Three quarter of hours, we can have a small, short break, or we just go until half past ten. You decide. <laughs> uh, please interrupt us at any time when you have a question. Uh, don't hesitate. Uh, this is our goal to make money. Yeah, the first year we know the administration is going on. Ah, this one. So let us start with. Uh, introduce you to our idea today and the related vocabularies of uh, ontology languages. And I put on this slide introduction to Sparkle, but we'll probably do Sparkle later uh, once you have been working with Protege. So Sparkle is a query engine, and we will do this uh, tomorrow probably. So I don't know what this slide is doing this, but okay, that's right, everything. So this is the topics uh, for this. Uh, introductory uh, session. So we we'll talk about what is a resource at all. So what are resources on the web? And then we will focus on language resources, give you some hints. What are language resources, uh, especially language resources on the web? So we will not talk about uh, books and these kind of things. Then we will introduce in uh, some detail to RDF, which stands for Resource Description Framework. And then we will uh, present some extension of this resource description framework. Uh, for example, uh, RDFS, as well as schema. Uh, we will talk about SCOS and SCOS Excel. SCOS stands for Simple Knowledge Objects uh, System. And then, uh, if time uh, allows, we will introduce to OWL, the, uh, the ontology, the web. Ontology language, I think this is the other way And as I said, the uh, Sparkle we will do uh, probably tomorrow, set tomorrow. And, um, but we will see. So, first of all, uh, I have some text every time I find something on Wikipedia which is relevant. Just take it. And so, this is, as you can see, the URL uh, above. Uh, this is about a resource. 
So what is a resource, basically? So we all use this term. Uh, in real life, uh, what is an oil resource? Uh, we also have a knowledge uh, resource, we have human resource. So you have different type. Just put the text here and you can read this later on, or just check the page. Um, so yes, so as you can see here, human resource. And the basic idea is that you always need something uh, in order to produce something else. So you need oil in order to make uh, petrol, you need uh, knowledge in order to, to give this lecture, for example. Uh, you need human resource to uh, realize the project. And so you have these different type of resources. One, uh, some can be a uh, physical or living organism, and some of them are more abstract, like, like knowledge. So this is in the real world, uh, outside. I mean, computer is also real world, but we talk about virtual reality there. So we also have a resource on the web. And uh, what is a resource on the web? And I also put some, uh, some text from uh, Wikipedia, because they were quite good, and they were introducing basically also to the resources in the framework. So a uh, web resource is with something important. This is everything we can find while navigating through the World Wide Web. Um, and this is a very broad definition. And the issue of resources is always also that you need first to be able to recognize them or to recognize the need you have for a resource, uh, to describe the resource, and then to access the resource. So for that. And when you have access to the resource, you want to transform it. You want to transform it so that you have a gain, uh, a benefit out of it. And this will be the topic of these uh, lectures. Uh, how can I describe a resource on the web? Uh, how can I find it? How can I access it? And how can I transform it so that I can do something valuable for my project or for whatever uh, application we have in mind? And uh, so we will have a focus, as I said, on a resource description framework, uh, which is basically for things that are on the web, for things that are accessible, that you can retrieve and that you can then uh, make with it what you want. Um, what? So, a little bit of history, I mean, for sure, when the world of work was emerging of the internet, or the base of internet, um, as they say here in this uh, uh, passage I'm quoting, a uh, resource was not even mentioned. People were talking about web objects or something you can uh, find or exchange. And there was a protocol in development at that time, and one of those is a very well known, uh, well, it's not a protocol basically, uh, but a uniform resource locator uh, that originally was called universal but then moved to uniform, is that you have a way to really locate your resource on the web. And this is the so called URL, the uniform resource locator. And so you have to name it to address it. And then when you address it with the HTTP protocol, and John will give you a little more detail on uh, how this works, uh, this HTTP as well as hypertext transfer protocol gives you back a document uh, or an object on the web. But at that time, uh, data, uh, web objects uh, were basically documents. And so we see later also the difference we might have between uh, your line, your end, and your end. But we use the URI, the Uniform Resource Identifier, uh, to talk about the objects, and now we call them resource, we can find uh, on the web. And so there were uh, so called RMCs, this is an uh, abbreviation for request for comments. So many people were sitting together and defining, uh, for example, vocabularies or protocols, and they were specifying uh, URLs and saying, okay, what? Can you do with it or how does it work? But basically, yes, so you have something in the web you can uh, access and you can then uh, get back and process. Um, so the first definition is set here in this pas uh, passage from, from Wikipedia uh, was in this request for comments. And as you see, it's already quite old uh, in terms of uh, development technology. And this is Basically, a strange definition, but it's the case a resource is anything that you can identify. So, a resource on the web is really a very broad uh, understanding of what is a resource. 
if anything you can uh, access a uh, uh, everything that has an identity. And to give an identity to a resource is to give a uh, URI. So this is the interaction between those uh, uh, web forms you write and what you can find you have to define what is a resource. So basically you can uh, define everything you want and then you need uh, a language to describe what you define and then you need a way to access it. And something we should say is that uh, I was saying before you need to access it on the web. The URI, the uh, unit from resource identifier, is the kind of generalization of a URL for abstracting all it. And this allows you to also describe the resource which are not all on the web, but maybe only on your computer. And even also for your uh, household, for your library, or whatever. So this uh, uh, identifier schema that is very powerful, and as I said, John uh, has some, some uh, slides to get into details into what is a uh, web from your mind. And then we have this definition, so that everything can be a resource with an abstract concept, uh, even operators and operands of mathematical equation. As soon as those have a URI, there is a resource on the web. And when we started to work together some years ago with other people, uh, we were starting to look at uh, language resources, and then we said, okay, if everything can be a resource on the web, then language data can also be a resource on the web. So every word you're using in every language or every formal uh, language uh, will get a URI and is a resource on the web. And our work consists in defining the framework to be able to describe those language data on the web uh, to have the necessary uh, metadata to describe those and to make them available and to play with them, to uh, work with them. And when we say language data, we don't need uh, to mean only Tomboha or lexicons, terminologies, we come back to this data, but we really everything, I mean, a comma, a special sign, everything which is used in language, it can get a real line. And the way we organize this is the topic of the session, of this lecture, and as the we will uh, get to work with Protégé and John Duden and myself will introduce to a format that we have been developing uh, uh, over the last years. And uh, John was a value thought behind this, so it's the best time to talk about this on the next level uh, description of what is a language in the web and more specifically in the semantic web. So, about language resource, just some information from you. Uh, in the past, uh, language resources have been uh, the content of a lot of specific uh, association initiative projects. And I would just like to mention some of the specialized uh, conferences, for example, uh, which are dealing with language resources. Uh, the biggest one, I guess, uh, the conference indicated language resource, it's called LLAC. And if you have interesting work on there, you can submit in November this year. The next conference will be in Marseille, in France. And so this was created in the year 98. And when you look at the topics that are described in the conference, you see the, the, the the kind of things that the, those, those conferences are dealing with. So you want to evaluate your language resource, because you want to see, uh, to be able to say if a language resource is good for your purposes. So you, you, you don't have only a word, but some description of those words or the top uh, Then you have some infrastructure issues uh, where you and how you impose language data, how you make it available. For a large study or for specific uh, uh, projects. And one case is here the project Alexis, which is uh, a project John and myself are working in. This is dealing with an infrastructure for lexicographical data, so a focus on uh, lexicography. And then there are issues like multimodality, so you might have a focus on a lexicon that is not only containing text, but also on modalities like speech, 
like a gesture, like images, or video, as I said, the speech component. Something we will be doing quite a bit with this terminology. So uh, the use of this uh, specific frameworks to uh, be able to describe the use of words in a specific domain. So to make sure that your usage of a word in a specific domain will have a unique interpretation. So this is what we call a term or terms, and the way we can encode those terms uh, in order to make them better or better. But I thought that if you have this on your computer, someone else can use this uh, information. It's exactly the same intended uh, meaning for this specific domain. And then there is an issue for all those data uh, type I was mentioning here. So how are they presented? <coughs> Some of them are just text, format, purpose, and then uh, we have other formats to uh, represent and encode them from very, very uh, simple, like raw data or CSV files, so comma separated files, uh, or use of database, and then we come to the topics that we will discuss at large in this uh, uh, lecture. So XML for extended public language, RTF for visual description framework, JSON is a serialization that you can put your, your data in a feature value matrix. And something we quite often forget is that there are uh, important legal aspects related to standard data. So if you build a corpus annotated, let's say, with dependency structure, uh, you might be wanting to say, okay, this corpus has specific uh, copyrights. Uh, it's for free or not for free. You have to cite me or you have to whatever. So there are a lot of, of, of possible uh, um, licenses that can be uh, associated with a language resource. And it's really a lot. <laughs> So this is something uh, you should pay attention to it uh, when working with uh, language data on the web and accessing them, processing them, transforming them, and giving it away to other people or sending them. So never uh, forget to check the licensing condition. This is something uh, very important. Now to give you some information, you could look at to see how let's say before uh, Autodex, before we introduce Autodex demo, or the RDF-based uh, implementation of language data, uh, there are some uh, repositories and catalogs, and this is just a, a small selection of it, just in the number of slides we have. Um, so there, there are, for example, associations, and in the past the role was uh, more important maybe than today, uh, because today you can get a lot of data directly on the web. <coughs> uh, but there is the LR uh, Association, the European Language Resource Association. They are also organizing the LR conference I mentioned before. And there is a pendant in the US called NDC, the Investing Data Consortium. So you can check those URLs and see what they are doing, uh, what do they have, and what, uh, what are the conditions we have for them to get data. So they don't only distribute data, but they also manipulate data and prepare data for specific uh, application. So there is a, another uh, type of uh, repository, so MetaShare, this is a European initiative, and uh, Meta is here about metadata, so how do you describe your data, how do you describe uh, language data? So this metadata are so complex for language data, so this is not just to say it's a word, but you have to put a lot, a lot of information to describe, for example, a word in the lexicon. So the importance of metadata, so data describing the data, uh, is very, is very important. And it was also one of the reasons why RDF was introduced. Uh, how can I describe the data I have in the, in the, in the web? So here, just to mention, uh, again, the importance of metadata for describing, for accessing it. And you have here three different models, some and uh, the link up is also something that I've been uh, maybe involved in. Uh, we might have some more details on this data infrastructure uh, during this lecture. So, yes, please. Will these slides be online? Yeah, yeah. They don't need to show that. Okay, okay. We'll, we'll put uh, after every session, uh, we'll ask my question. <laughs> oh, by the way, this is our site. If you have a problem, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, we'll put this uh, online. 
and a commercial working on it. <laughs> so those are some information, and then you can also consult the project analysis and the catalogs, which are the project we are working for the, the URL at the end of the session. So yeah, so those are the topics. And there is another uh, interesting uh, repository for language resources, also related with the uh, conference. So participants to this conference having submitted a uh, uh, paper, a presentation paper, are requested or asked for describing the data following the data scheme. <coughs> and so this is then a report which is bottled up, <coughs> let's say code driven, and say, okay, how can I describe my, my uh, language data? So we will see that language data is really not an easy uh, issue uh, to describe uh, something that's still simple to us, something like that for language. Uh, it's, a big, uh, it's a big issue. So uh, this is the, the type of language data we will be dealing with in this uh, lecture. This is the so-called uh, linguistic link open data cloud. So everything here is in the cloud. And, uh, <coughs> You see those bubbles, and those bubbles are different colors. And you see uh, relations, links between those bubbles. And this is the way you can see how a description of one language resource uh, is co uh, acting with other language resources. So interoperability, and uh, yeah, this is a big issue. And this is something uh, we can do because we are using RDF for the resource description framework. This is something which is really easy, this kind of uh, cross linking uh, of uh, different types of uh, language data. So basically, uh, at the end uh, of this week, you might have something you might ask to upload in this uh, linguistic and open data. So we will also have some words on how this works and what can be done uh, to publish your data and uh, this format. And for uh, details, we will give uh, part of it. Just to mention the type of uh, language data that are currently present in the linguistic open data, I just put uh, an arrow to the, the legend. So we have corpora, lexical dictionaries, uh, so this is one main aspect of this project analysis. Terminology, thesauri, and we will uh, come back to thesauri data, and knowledge bases like Wikipedia or uh, Wikidata. Uh, so we can relate uh, language data immediately to a knowledge base, uh, for example, in the medical domain uh, or the legal domain. So these specific terminologies, uh, with those uh, means, we can really link. Uh, Specialized language data to specialize uh, domain description. So, uh, linguistic resources of the data are also found there. Linguistic data categories, so what we mean by part of speech, for example, this is a noun, this is an adjective. Uh, what kind of uh, uh, syntactic categories do we have? And then we also have topological database, and maybe other type of data we cannot classify or label yet. So this would be the main topic. And this linguistic link open data is in fact part of this bigger big data. And if you go there, uh, you will see that other type of data. So the big one I think is linguistics. This is something uh, quite a number of people have said to John myself and other people have been publishing in the in the big big data uh, cloud. But if you go there using this uh, URL, you can even click on the bubbles and see what's inside. So this is really nice. And then you can download the resource. And, uh, and an important thing is that in this new data, you have something here in the middle. It should be the biggest one, but I don't see it right now. Uh, called Wikipedia. And Wikipedia is a formal view of Wikipedia. And there is a new one emerging called Wikidata. So Wikidata is an initiative from the Wikimedia Foundation. And they basically uh, restart encoding their data originally in RTF, so in a native way. And this is also getting bigger and bigger. And more and more uh, other 
data sets are linking to Wikidata. So Wikipedia is not from Wikimedia Foundation, uh, but uh, clearly they take the data uh, from Wikipedia. And you can see the intensity of connections uh, where you are doing very, very dark, so a lot, lot of connections between different. Uh, and the apparently this is some island, I don't know this one, but they don't really uh, interrelate to the Sort of bio stuff. Okay. So, uh, so this is uh, the thing we'll be dealing with. Uh, we will uh, see how you can import your data and to make this available in this linguistic data and uh, how you can also access it. But uh, now let's start uh, with the real stuff. So, this was a preliminary uh, description about uh, RDF, at least all this description framework. And again, some text that uh, comes with the last slide like this. Uh, uh, the idea was released in uh, 99, and there was some uh, later uh, version. And this is a standard by the WTC consortium. Uh, the WTC consortium is a standardization body, uh, very important for us. Uh, they did, for example, HTML, and HTML, and no, RTF, and all. <coughs> and the Autolex uh, level uh, work is also part of the WGC, so standard for this result of the community. So, so how, how do you want to uh, access data on the web? As I said, it's not only that you want to get an object back, but you want to get some information about the subject. For example, for a, a Word document, let's say, or an HTML document, you want to know who is the author, what it was created, and what is the content. And this is the kind of thing that is getting into a resource. So if you describe the content of something and this description itself is a resource, which you uh, formalize and you can use uh, after your this. And since you can describe the content of your uh, web page, let's say, using RTF, but also the description of this content is also an RTF, that you go in the recursive way and you get abstract and more and more abstract. And as, as such, you can really have very, very abstract things that get a, a, a description, yeah. and those are resources, even if they are very, very uh, abstract. So uh, basically, we can also say that uh, RDF deals with uh, class properties and concepts that are identified by your eyes. <coughs> so even a concept, let's say the concept of beauty or whatever, or, yeah, uh, gets a URI right, and as such it is that a resource of that. So what you would consider to be a concept is suddenly a, uh, something that you can define as a uh, We will see this later that we might also have a resource that you don't want to give a name to. So anonymous resources, uh, we see later uh, when this is uh, being used. And I could not resist but to, to put some uh, a note from Tim Berners-Lee. For those of you uh, who don't know him, he was one of the main person in the development of the world wide web, uh, which emerged from the uh, physical world. And uh, so he's, we see he's the creator of the world wide web. It was not alone, but he was uh, the most prominent guy. <coughs> and this is for a nice text because we have saying that when RDF was first adopted, it was what you need for, the need for data about resource. So you want to say, okay, like the old library catalog, what is this book about? Who is the author? Uh, what is the topic? How many pages does it have? What was it written? And so this is, uh, again, the importance of the data for describing content. And but then at the end, uh, a resource on the web can be anything. And this is the strange, but this is the case, it's anything. And in, in the ontological version, really uh, over an RTF uh, model, uh, we put this data too, uh, people do not use the resource at the top level, not, but they call it think. So this is the most abstract resource you can have. Uh, in an ontological description, 
uh, but be aware of the bathing is a resource in terms of uh, uh, RDF and those ontological language. So the empty set is also a resource for the city. So, yes, it's, it's uh, really important. So, resources, everything you can identify uh, with uh, your life and you can access with the exception of uh, those anonymous tools. You can see data what it is. So, basically, uh, I can just repeat if everything can be identified by the URI, then also uh, all possible language data. So, a nice uh, summary I took from the company Autotext. Uh, resource, I want to anything about target VNs. So, now uh, getting into the detail of, of RDF. So, RDF, as I mentioned before, is a family of standards developed by the uh, World Wide Consortium, short WGC. And it was, as I also mentioned before, a metadata model. So that you describe the data we have on the web. Uh, you make it as specific as possible, but as uh, intelligible as possible so that you can easily access it. So um, this was adopted uh, in 1999 and there is some And now the current version is the one that was uh, released in 2014. So what I was just saying here. Uh, the column is here indicating <coughs> the big one that you have that dealing with a, uh, a node which has a URI to access it. You don't see it here on the next slide, you will see a more textual version, but less readable or less understandable. Um, the subject is always something which has an old, old going arrow. And the object is something getting pointed to by an arrow in this diagram. And the blue lines represent the properties, uh, which is the other word for predicate. And something important about those uh, details very often we will use the so called XMS schema types or XMS types. And this is a fixed number of possible, yeah. Data types. Uh, you could have a URI, a Boolean date, yes or no, a date, like this one. So, this is a so called XSC type. So, those are the values for an object, a possible value for an object. This is forbidden for predicate, forbidden for subject, uh, that are typically used. And, yeah, like in every programming language, for sure, we have strings. And this is a very simplified one, like this one. And now I have a question. Um, who can tell me? Uh, something I forgot to say, uh, by the way. So we call those properties that link a node with a URI, with another node with a URI, we call them object property, or object type property, because they link between two objects. And, and those properties here uh, are called data types properties. They link to uh, data values. So, with this, we would be ready. Uh, yeah, uh, something uh, before we finish on our RDF. I was mentioning the anonymous uh, notes before. Uh, why do we need this? Uh, but we don't really need this, but it can be very practical. If you want to move information, but you don't really want to keep this uh, in your object world, and <coughs> for example, uh, in this case, uh, I can't do it anymore. Uh, let's say this one. <laughs> so you have here yeah, information that's uh, this document, for example, this is the document you should look at anyway. This uh, RDF primer or RDF syntax primer, this is the URL. This is a document on the web. And uh, you'll see here the, the full description of the, uh, 
So you are you arrive. There is a property called editor, and then you don't want to, to create a name for this one. And what you say, you group this information that uh, there is a home page and there is a name associated with it. So you don't want to really to name everything you are using in your graph structure. But something I didn't mention very enough. Uh, RDF is all about graphs, nodes and arrows between nodes. Nodes and uh, so called edges. So, so you don't want to name it. Uh, so it might be practical, but then later if you want to access it, it's going to be more difficult. And since they don't have a name, if you have the same node somewhere else, uh, you cannot say it's the same node. I mean, if you have something that is similar, but since they have no name, I so that this is the name for this, uh, you can, it's more difficult to access it. And so in certain sequences, it might be nice because you want to group information and you don't want to give them, uh, let's say, a ontological status. So, uh, important is that RDF is the model. When we see this, it's really a model. And even if many people were using XML to represent it, uh, XML is just a so-called serialization for it. So the model is really abstract. And RDF is building on top of XML, but it's independent of it. So you can use XML to represent it. And I will have uh, an example uh, now. But you can use uh, any, well, not any, but you can find a lot of uh, other serialization. Maybe you already heard of the name of uh, Turbus, Tax or JSON, uh, MD, or MTIPUS. So this is the kind of information. Uh, so, I would say this was part of RDF, the third part. Uh, if you have questions on it, or if you want to have a final request, if any, I will just go ahead with the text. And this is where we get into the topic of extensions of vocabularies that are building on the top of RDF and uh, allow us to be more precise, for example, on the topic of representative language data. The first thing we would like to present is the so called RDF schema, uh, which you will see very often represented as uh, RDF S, with or without brackets. And, uh, and the idea is that we get to a series of vocabularies, some additional features, let's say, we can add to RDF syntax uh, to build something we would like to have. For example, not only a set of such triples, because RTF is just a set of triples, uh, but something more structured. And for example, saying that horse is an animal, or a dog is an animal. Um, so you want to create, uh, this is what you would do with RTF, you say dog. Is an animal, but you could also create a structure uh, like a cat is a subclass of animal. And there are more restrictions, but this is the most important uh, addition provided by RTFS. So, all of you who have been working with in, in taxonomic domain like bio biology or whatever are used to this for sure. And one thing which is important <coughs> in taxonomies. Uh, you always add some kind of label, and you could say a uh, definition, for example, of a definition. But if you add some information, uh, that is, for example, a readable for, for us, for the human, not only for the machine. So we want to work only for the machine, yeah. Uh, and this is also an addition uh, given by IFS. Because here, you could not do anything else, just have a URI, a URI, and a URI, that's it in RDF. But if you want to add some description for the human reader, the subject is not possible in RDF, but RDF has uh, made this. So just a picture of uh, another kind of picture as this one, so the addition of the RDF vocabulary. Uh, so you have the data, like this, in RDF, 
and then you are able to add uh, some hierarchical structure. So, paint a subclass of five cars and painting two. And then, uh, if you have property called painters, then you can say, okay, in my domain it should be a painter, and in my range it should be a painting. And so this one we can skip, this is the same thing, which is that we have a main node here again, so that you can see that uh, you are grouping information, which you don't want to name. Uh, the node just to be this. And this is the real life. And I mentioned RTF label, RTFS, sorry, or comment. I will definition there as comment. So you have this kind of properties. So those are also a nodes. Uh, and this is what is supposed to be given to the human reader of this. Uh, not really readable uh, syntax. And what you see here, so this is again about the city. So this is RDF. You can recognize the prefix. We will see prefix and long URL later. Uh, you have a description, this is about Berlin. And you have here this uh, relation, capital of, again, a URL uh, of Germany, nothing else. <clears throat> and, and here, this is the RTFS label. And something nice, in this table we can specify if it's English, or German, or French, or whatever. <coughs> for sure, for Berlin, it doesn't make a lot of difference. But uh, you can imagine uh, uh, other names of cities that change depending on the language. Uh, and here you have another. This is about the city. Then you have this resource. And again, here you have the language. Here you have German. And this is that. And this is the kind of label I can associate to the class city. And uh, I can say that in German, we call it that. Or for country to say, in German we call it uh, land. And you could put any other language uh, inside. So, this is the way the first, uh, let's say, development in the RDF world that we can add really a uh, natural language uh, as related to the classes. But this is just a definition, a comment, or a label. But uh, RDFS, comment or label, are uh, said really nice, but still, uh, this is a literal, so this is at the end of the graph. So you, you cannot say, for example, what is the difference between bank and bank, or you cannot say that this one uh, is a noun, a German, uh, neutral. Uh, this kind of information about speed, gender, number, uh, it's impossible to state this at this level. Just, just because this is a term that they might be involved, and you cannot have any error uh, starting from there. Right. And this is where another vocabulary has been developed. Um, uh, what it's called, basically. And SOS itself as an extension. And SOS stands for a simple knowledge organization system. Uh, also, the URL is here. And this is a model for uh, being able to express this kind of hardware structure, but also relations between uh, elements like fairs. And so, of course, it's very important, it's very popular, and you can find this uh, a lot in the uh, so called control vocabularies or terminologies or taxonomies or the source. Uh, it's all using RDF constructs, 
but adding uh, uh, some information. And one information which is very important is that uh, SOS is, is taking label as an object. So, I think label is a data type property. But it's okay. No, let's look at this kind of thing. And let's say that this kind of thing is an object or is also a resource with a URI. So this kind of uh, putting this up, it's no longer a, a terminal, but it's also uh, a, a class uh, in your description. And then you can say, for example, which is your preferred label, uh, which is your uh, alternative label. And this doesn't go, as I mentioned before, basically for the use of terminologies. So in terminologies, you will always have preferred term, uh, which want to be really unambiguous for all those in your domain. So if the car company Volkswagen uh, is employing a lot of terminologies, so they are uh, making cars everywhere in the world, and they have to make sure that every element of the car has a preferred term that is unambiguous for the people working in Brazil, for example. So they have a note for this element of the car, and they have all the uh, let's say also terminal for this. So this is basically transforming what is pointed from this RTFS label to a, a string here, to a XST string. It's transforming it to something that points to an object to, uh, uh, to make sure that you can have this kind of relation. And so this course is about concepts in the terminology, for example, and this is a motivation, and then you have some different flavors, and in various language. And there is one goal, so this will be a node in your, in your structure, and you will have a fresh label in various languages. And an important rule, of course, is that you have one preferred label per language, but as many uh, alternative labels as you want or as you need. And, and then you can have some relations between those uh, labels. So this is now a label, and this label can be realized in English, in the patient, uh, and in other language languages. Actually, I would prefer to have here uh, something which is not a patient, but this is helping you to mark the difference. So this is a node, this is a URL, this is not a word, this is a URL, and this is the way it is realized in English and other languages. But, so we put this higher as a class, as an instance of a class label, and then we can say, by the way, I can say it's a kind of language. And I have also some relation between those. I can see it's narrower or broader, so the kind of relation you have typically in the test levels. Right? Another example, where you have here uh, a concept called CA, this is what I prefer. We don't have a word as such, just a code. And you have a kind label associated with it. You have some relation between the concepts. But uh, as I said, this is my term, in a sense, in my. Uh, no, sorry, this is a concept, this is a uh, label. And this label is realized we have just kind of read from here. And then you have alternative label. Ah, this is about violence, yeah. So this is about violence, terrorism, and civil violence. And you can define. Such, let's say, yeah, easy relations like narrow or broader. You don't want to specify too much. So this is what you can do with us. And I said there's a lot of technologies, multilingual technologies available around. And the European uh, Union has also been developing uh, such uh, technologies uh, using this course. And so you will find a lot of data uh, in your work uh, now, we still have a problem for the linguistic point of view, sorry. Uh, ah, I just want to give you another example from the 
semantic uh, company, so we work with them to so allow myself to take examples from them. So they have a tool which is called Bull Party in Vienna, okay? But the tool is called Bull Party. And so and you can see that they have a perfect label uh, for this tool or for this uh, engine, Bull Party to start server. Uh, but they have an alternative label like PPT. Yeah, this is the abbreviation of this one. But we still have a problem to, to relate this one to this one, as you can see, uh, how to do this. Now, this is the way you can play with cost and uh, say, okay, I have a preferred label. So this is the official name of my tool. And, and then you may have an alternative label. And this can see any relations uh, between this and this uh, concept. But now I want to express uh, relations between those labels. And this is also something we discovered, as well as we, but people in the WHPC, it's not easy to state that this one, the value of the property uh, at its label, that this one is a translation of this one. And I even think this is a wrong position to do one, but uh, so it's difficult to, it's easy to, to describe relations between concepts, uh, but between those uh, realization of that, it's not easy or not feasible. And this is why we create the so-called trusting cell, and it allows us through the syntax to really uh, and some information like this translation of as isocode or is hybrid of. And this is really a very good uh, development for supporting conceptual learning what technologies. So those are uh, um, data or resources on the web you will also find a lot with this because uh, Excel. And next one. So this is taken from a uh, from paper by a colleague of us in Saragossa. And so that you would have a concept of the colos. You would have a French label with the colos, which is a signal form. So this is the term uh, class, and this is the literal synthesis. And here you can have a label relation. And say this is an acronym for so TB is an acronym for tuberculosis. So we are near at the end of what we need to describe uh, language data and all possible language resources and all possible relations between language resources. So Scott's itself was already uh, a very nice development. <coughs> and here now again some visualization uh, to, to insist on the both as offered by Scott itself. Uh, you will see here again from the partner uh, selected by the company. It's a very nice uh, block, so you can have a look at it. Uh, and the point is that the label is now a resource. And this was in the Scott's world, and this is the Scott itself world. And then you can have those relations. And uh, here, for example, Don't see the relation. Yeah, okay, we can uh, add attributes for, for the labels. This is also the case in this uh, course. But you can uh, add some uh, relations between the labels, like this one here. Yeah, this is a translation. So you can know uh, in this RDF. Framework, or on top of this other framework, you can uh, resolve the problem, add such information, like this is the translation of this one. And if we go back to the former example of violence, you see that we get a lot more information um, because we are able 
to uh, specify uh, intermediate goals, which was this cost per table, going from the concept directly to the return. And here we can introduce the entry and our relation to the star here. Uh, one example I uh, suggest you could look at, uh, it's a really nice example, it's called Gazis. And this is uh, a thesaurus on social science, uh, for languages. And then you can really consult and play with it and see uh, how terms are now encoded in the cell. So, we have introduced the concept of a resource until now and show how the resource this description paper has been developed and described mainly metadata associated with the resource. Uh, that means uh, this so that uh, it's not too easy in this RDF to describe language data as such. And then we have been showing uh, the extension to RDF and RDFS because it's not successful. And we have shown how natural language data is increasingly better represented using such vocabularies. Uh, so that we can now say that language data is kind of similar to other data, to word knowledge data. Um, and um, yeah, so this is uh, what we do with this cell. cell. And, and tomorrow, we will talk about Autolex Lemma, but before this I have to switch uh, to another presentation, uh, which is really uh, the, the presentation from us that is now the de facto standards uh, for representing language data 